Hi, my name is Tom Manning, and I'm a chemistry professor at Valdosta State University. I'm here today to tell you about my passion, which is teaching, but a specific aspect of it. It's projects that I do with students that are meant to tackle real-world problems. But first, I'd like to tell you how I got my start in this. When I was in fifth grade, we had our annual science fair, and I decided to do it on octopi slash octopus. The problem is in New York City, there were no octopi or octopus. There was also no Amazon, no internet, no FedEx. So I ended up sending three letters out. One went to a marine lab in India, Italy. Two went to marine labs in Florida. All three labs within a month sent back boxes that had octopi slash octopus and formaldehyde and had beaks and envelopes. I was, I was for a middle school boy, I hit pay dirt. This was the first time I had a project first time I had an idea and I was able to follow through on it and I had actually interacted with other people that cared a little bit about what I was doing. This was very influential. What, my, what this approach involves is problem solving. Right? We take on significant problems that are facing the planet. You'll see that the things that we do range from environmental to new drugs. The third part is their economical. When we come up with a solution, it has to be something that can be easily done on a large scale. For example, if we're developing a drug for a developing country, it cannot be expensive. Peer review is a critical part of this. We're not just doing projects, we're doing something that will meet peer review, meaning that when a student is done with their project, it should be good enough that it can be published in a journal or win a United States patent. Also, another part of this is that the project should have a sense of adventure. Right? I try to avoid repetitious measurements that can be boring. Um, I try to come up with dynamic ideas where everybody can relate to why it's important. And again, I want to emphasize that we're doing this with undergraduates. Why is that important? Because they're not full-time graduate students, postdocs, or scientists. They have a limited schedule, a limited amount of time available to them. The resources we have at our undergraduate school do not have a lot of the technology that, say, a large research university has or that a pharmaceutical company might have. So we have to really think about our solutions. Okay, so let me give you the first case. There's a drug called Bryostatin. It's the first drug that has been shown to reverse Alzheimer's or slow it down. It's not just a treatment, but a potential cure. Um, it treats HIV reservoirs that retrovirals do not attack, and it's been shown, shown to have strong anti-cancer properties. The problem with this is that it's extraordinarily expensive. Bryostatin costs about $15 million per gram. It was originally extracted from a marine organism called Bugulin arantina that is found in the marine environment, the oceans. So while the elite universities and the big pharmaceutical companies are concentrated on lab-based synthesis for a molecule like this, we decided to go in the other direction. We decided to go back to the ocean. Now we've developed a method where the bacteria that lives inside bugula that makes bryostatin, we can grow it in our buckets. But there's a little bit more to the buckets than just water. It took us years to work out what kind of surface it can grow on. What else has to be in there? What type of nutrients? What location do we put it in? what time of year, how deep. There's a lot of different parameters that went into it until we finally said we have it. So we can now make bryostatin, although in low quantities, but we can make it at a much more economical rate and adhering to the principles of green technology. And this was all done with undergraduates making lots of trips to the beach. I'd like to tell you a little about our projects with coral restoration. Now corals worldwide are diminishing in number, and in health. Much of this has to do with human interactions, pollution, climate change, things of that nature. So we started to develop a material that was designed to send out a chemical cue and attract coral larvae to its surface. Once the coral larvae were there, they would then start growing. In the upper left hand corner, you can see one of our corals growing in Florida Keys. We've gotten three small grants to help support this project and we have a permit from NOAA to do coral restoration in Florida Keys. Once, twice, sometimes three times a year, we pack up and we head down to the Keys. As a group of students, we spend our time at camps, economical. We cook out, economical, and we go and visit our coral sites. So, 
Students love it. It's an adventure and it's new science. Antibiotic resistance. It's something that is now starting to scare the planet. We may be reversing into the role or the time frame before the antibiotic boom started. One of the great killers in the history of humanity is tuberculosis. Currently, two billion people worldwide have TB. The form of it that's the most concerning is drug-resistant TB. So there are drugs out there that treat it, but they have terrible side effects, and they're not 100% effective, and are also very expensive. So developing countries have a difficult or impossible time affording it. Our approach, working with students, has been to take an existing antibiotic that no longer works against drug-resistant TB and make it work again. We do this by basically encasing it in three or four very inexpensive uh, chemicals that actually enhance the activity of the original antibiotic. They also disguise the original antibiotic. It's like a Trojan horse. Resistance recognizes a specific molecule. If you dress it up, Trojan horse goes right through. This is the United States patent that we won after four years of back and forth with the patent office. The two co-authors on it with it were Sydney and Tess, and they were undergraduates at BSU. Not many undergraduates, you know, win a, 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 a U.S. patent on a new type of drug. Oysters. You think of food when I say oysters, but oysters are one of the great environmental situations on our planet right now. 85 to 88 percent of all the oyster bars that were there 200, 300 years ago are now gone. Oysters are a keystone species. They provide habitat for all sorts of fish, crabs, etc. Um, they control shoreline erosion. Once a uh, once a, a, an oyster bar is gone, there starts to be problems with the shoreline disappearing. Um, and they also filter water. One oyster can filter 50 gallons of water a day. On this paper, this is where I emphasize the peer review, you'll see that there are a number of undergraduates co-authors. All the co-authors in this are um, students that work with me. This project spread over four or five years. It was done off the coast of Georgia and as well as off the coast of Florida. Cancer drugs. Cancer is the number two killer on our planet in terms of diseases behind heart disease. Uh, many of the drugs that are put out by American pharmaceuticals are too expensive for developing countries. We have focused in on uh, cervical cancer that is caused by HPV. Last year, over 300,000 women died from this form of cancer and had HPV. So we've taken existing cancer drugs that are fairly inexpensive and we've repurposed them so that they work better and they also work at a more economical level. Our undergraduates spanning over 15 years have had 20 new cancer drugs from our lab enter preclinical trials. Okay, that's an accomplishment. Um, we've also published a large number of papers. And if a student can make it in our lab where well, we are not overwhelmed with large amounts of technology, that means that you can also make it in a developing country. If the ingredients that we use are very inexpensive, that means in a developing country they'll have access to them. So cancer drugs, right? think of problem solving, rather than just looking what's online or memorizing a bunch of drug names and structures, our students are tackling the problem of expensive pharmaceuticals uh, and for some of the most competitive diseases on the planet. So finally, let me tell you about this picture. It was taken just a few weeks ago in the chemistry lab at VSU. The man in the center behind the V state is Congressman Carter. He is a pharmacist. He's the only pharmacist in the U.S. Congress right now. You'll see surrounding him, there's nine students total, as well as two adults. Um, they just finished giving a presentation to the congressman about their projects. They included malaria, tuberculosis, bryostatin for HIV and Alzheimer's, and cancer drugs. But they all rallied behind a single point, implants. Right? If you can have a biodegradable implant that costs virtually nothing, say less than a dollar, then you have something that can be used in a third world or a developing country. The students here have been developing implants for different types of diseases. What does that mean? That means that instead of a 
tuberculosis patients going to a doctor every day and having five, six, seven pills to take, they can have an implant put into their arm or in, a, in an artery or actually inhale it and only have to have drugs once every two weeks and with less side effects and less cost. Same thing for a cancer patient or same thing for a malaria patient. Two of the students up there started working on a taking an existing malaria drug, quinine, that long, no longer works and trying to repurpose it and make it work again. So this attracted the attention of the congressman and he came to our lab at Valdosta State to hear the students give their, their hour-long presentation. So I'd like to take a minute and thank you, but think STP solved the problem. That's the best way to teach. It's aggressive, it's problem-solving, and you're preparing our students for tomorrow. Thank you.